All you remain standing. We're so glad to have Brother and Sister Meadows with us today. They're on deputation for Metro Missions. They're headed to Philadelphia. Uh, and I, I've never been to Philadelphia, but I guess it's one of the oldest cities in the country, if not the oldest. And uh, there's so much history there. And I know that God is ready for y'all to make a new history in Philadelphia. You know, I, I, I just got this feeling that whatever uh, this family puts their hand to, God wants to bless them, kind of an Abraham uh, blessing, amen. Wherever you put your foot, I'm going to bless you, amen. I'm going to bless those who bless you. And this morning, we want to bless them, hallelujah. And even though we're not going to Philadelphia to start a work in a city, uh, I guess the crime rate there is pretty extensive. I mean, uh, it, it's, a, it's a metropolis. And, uh, uh, and when God calls somebody into a place like that, it takes a special anointing, a special calling. But we've already seen that through his ministry. But I believe this, not only do we want to support him in our prayers as they are on deputation this year, amen, but with our finances also. And uh, I believe God's going to do a great work. How many of y'all believe in home missions? Hallelujah. Amen. I know you do because you're a very giving church. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a great big hand as Brother Matters comes to minister the word of God. Well, you may be seated in Jesus' name. It is uh, certainly an honor and a uh, privilege to be with you here this morning, and uh, I guess we were here just a little over a month ago, I suppose, and uh, that's when we were an evangelist, and uh, we were doing our own scheduling, and now that we are on deputation, each district does our scheduling for us, and I got a phone call and said, you're going to be in Paragol, Arkansas, and I said, I know some people in Paragol. And they said, you're going to be with Pastor Rethridge and Greater Vision. And so we're very, very excited to be here with you this morning and this evening, expecting God to do some fantastic things. So let me take just a moment and kind of uh, help some of you out. If you do not know what Metro Missions is, if you do not know what a Metro Missionary is, um, we are appointed by the United Pentecostal Church International Headquarters to go to the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and plant a church for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you perhaps have had foreign missionaries here more than you have Metro missionaries, there's more of them. Uh, Metro missions works almost exactly like foreign missions works. A couple are appointed by the United Pentecostal Church to go to a location and plant a work for Jesus Christ. And then they enter a time called deputation where we travel um, to different churches. We're in a different church generally every single service, sometimes four or five nights a week. And uh, we minister the word of the Lord and gather partners with us in prayer and in finances. And then we go to the city of Philadelphia and plant a church for Jesus Christ. Metro Missions is a five-year appointment. Once we get on site, we will be full-time for five years. The church will be full-time for five years. And we'll have that amount of time to plant a church that is self-supporting and autonomous in those five years. So that's what Metro Missions is. That's why we're here this morning. The um, city of Philadelphia... Pennsylvania, its metro area has over 5 million people in it in the Pennsylvania area alone. If you count New Jersey, it's over 6 million, but just in the Pennsylvania area, over 5 million people. And uh, there are 10 United Pentecostal churches within a 60-mile radius of the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's one church for every 500,000 people, and most of them are along that 60-mile perimeter, and they're not very close to the city at all and so even in 60 miles it takes two three hours to drive that with city traffic so you can kind of get an idea of the burden and the mission that is there in the city itself there are 1.5 million people that live there and there are only two truth preaching churches there both of those are side by side on the north side of the city there's nothing in the middle of the city nothing in the south of the city for over 1.5 million people just those two churches that makes it 750,000 people per church that's what they need to run to reach the city of Philadelphia Pennsylvania where we are headed is South Philadelphia where over 170,000 people live and there has never been a truth preaching church in South Philadelphia Philadelphia 
it's shocking, it's amazing. Uh, I'm from southeast Missouri, and we're kind of in the Bible Belt here where there's churches on every corner and churches across town and here, there, and everywhere. I, I went to church when I was young in a, a city of, uh, of less than 1,000 people, and we had three United Pentecostal churches there. And so to go to a city like Philadelphia with that many people and, and no churches just is shocking, and, and it's hard to believe, but it's the truth nonetheless. Uh, when you think Philadelphia, if, uh, if you're a history guru, you probably think of things like Independence Hall or the Liberty Bell. Uh, the city of Philadelphia served as our nation's capital at one point while Washington, D.C. was being constructed. The Declaration of Independence was signed there. Our forefathers gathered there. It's a very historic place, to say the least. If, if you're a little less history-minded or perhaps you're more spiritually minded than perhaps you know about William Penn, the founder of the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was a one God believer. As a matter of fact, he went to prison because he would not deny the oneness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it has a terrific spiritual history and background. Uh, if you're not spiritually minded or, or politically or historically minded, perhaps you're carnally minded, let me appeal to you this morning. Philadelphia is famous for the soft pretzel and the cheesesteak. And somebody said, hallelujah, thank God for it. <clears throat> the city of Philadelphia has 43% African American, 41% Caucasian, 7% Hispanic, 6% Asian, 1% Native American, and a whole lot of other things thrown in there somewhere. It's a multicultural city, to say the least, and a multicultural church is necessary. It is one of the crime capitals of the world, uh, but they need the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning, before I minister to you the word, why don't you go with me via video to the city of Philadelphia for just a few moments. There are moments and times in our life, demarcating moments, where God calls us and he places a burden on our life. We hear that voice of God. I believe that we've heard that call. You're the king of this people. You're the Lord of this nation. subways to streetcars, from high-rise apartments to beautiful colonial homes, from swanky penthouses to the slums, from heroes to homeless, from professional to impoverished, from famous to infamous. 1.5 million people follow the city limits of Philadelphia. The entire metro Philly area Five million people call. Yet the United Pentecostal Church, Pennsylvania District, has only 10 churches within 15 miles of the city limits of Philadelphia. And only two churches inside the city limits. For the metro area, that's one church for every 500,000 people. And for the city itself, that's one church for every 750,000. How could we not be overwhelmed with burden? How could we not feel the call of God? There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. The heart of Philadelphia, the largest city in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, is the fifth most populous city in the United States of America. It's located in the northeastern part of the United States near the school kill in Delaware River. The city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, founded by William Penn, a man who believed in Jesus Christ, a man who believed in the oneness of God. Philadelphia is surrounded by temples and tabernacles and beautiful cathedrals. But when I think church in Philadelphia, 
might think of individuals like William Penn. William Penn went to prison for this one God message. We're on a mission and a mandate from God to come and preach and proclaim with passion this one God message, to sound a voice that this truth is marching on. That's what Project Philadelphia is all about. How many gods are there? South Philadelphia, an area of the city that's home to over 170,000 people, an area that's as multicultural as anywhere in the country. Yet there is not a United Pentecostal church here, nor has there ever been a United Pentecostal church in South Philadelphia. We are on a mission to come to the city of Philadelphia so that every soul can feel the liberty and the freedom of Jesus Christ. We are asking you now to consider partnering with Project Philadelphia and the Metters. We're asking you first of all to partner with us in your prayers. Pray for us daily that God will help us reach this city. Second of all, partner with us in your finances. We need your help to come to this city and do the mission and the work that God has prepared us to do. You can partner with us by going to our website, www.projectphiladelphia.org, and clicking on the partner link at that page. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Well, it's our prayer that hopefully this video could share with you somewhat of our vision and our burden for where we are headed and give you a glimpse of the place that we are going. Uh, we are here asking for your support. Uh, prayers first and foremost. Pray for us daily from this point forward, if you will, that God would uh, help us reach the people of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Help us to find favor in the city. Pray that God would send us people. We're praying to go with the team when we start. Pray that God would send us workers and laborers from the field. And uh, pray with us that God would help us get off deputation as quickly as possible. We officially started deputation January 2nd. And they tell us it takes 12 to 24 months to complete deputation. Uh, but we're rebuking that in Jesus' name and praying that we can get there speedily. Every day that we are on the deputation field, just under 50 people die in the area of the city that we are going alone. And that's 50 people that we'll never have the opportunity to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with. And so we need to get there as soon as possible. Finally, if you would consider partnering with us with your finances, there are partner cards in the back. And with your pastor's permission, we would love to have you join us, partner with us on a monthly basis. We have some items in the back my wife does for sale that helps with traveling expenses. And uh, so stop by the table before you leave. And then finally, we have a bucket in the back. If you cannot support us monthly, you don't want to buy anything back there, there's a bucket designated for chairs, uh, much like you have here. When we get to Philadelphia, we need to purchase chairs for people to sit in to have church. They cost around $30 a piece, so if you have a bucket, you want to drop something in for that, we would certainly appreciate that as well. We can take cash, check, or card for any of that back there, and I know the Lord will bless you for that. Well, I feel Jesus in the house, and um, I want to preach to you this morning. So why don't you stand with me for just a few moments I'll direct your attention to John chapter 12 and verse number 17. So good to have my wife with me. And then this time our son Parker is here. And uh, sometimes Parker can scream and cry a little bit when I preach. It's okay. He's trained in intercessory prayer, so fear not. <clears throat> and uh, he may just preach with me here in just a moment. So John chapter 12, verse number 17. I am well aware of the time. And I promise you I am hungrier than the rest of you. So I will be mindful of that this morning. John chapter 12, verse number 17, if you have it, shout amen. amen. The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive Ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks, not geeks, they were, they were Greeks, among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, 
we would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. And I want to preach to you from this text the title, We Would See Jesus. Now, why don't you place your Bible down, lift your voices, your hands, and your hearts toward heaven, and let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you with thanksgiving, with exaltation, and adoration. From the very bottom of my heart and from the depth of my soul, I cry out unto you, believing that you will respond to our faith and our believing. Uh, anoint our ears to hear, our minds to comprehend, and our hearts to receive what thus saith the word of the Lord. And we will not fail to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now clap your hands one more time to Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Our, our text depicts a scene uh, in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says uh, that Jesus has made his way to this city and that the masses have flocked around him because word has spread abroad that Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, you, you have somebody get up out of a wheelchair in your service. You have somebody uh, come back to life, and uh, it, it tends to draw a crowd at times. And so word has spread abroad that this Jesus can, can open blinded eyes. He can unstop deaf ears. He can unmute the muted tongue. He can cleanse the leper. He, he raises the dead. As a matter of fact, he, he doesn't do it just for the Jews, but the Bible says he, he has begun to do it even for Syrophoenician women and, and, and women of here, there, and everywhere, and men from here, there, and everywhere. And, and He'll do it for anybody. And so uh, there, there were some individuals, the Bible says, of Greek descent that made their way to this city and and unfortunately for them they got there a bit late and they didn't get a front row seat uh <clears throat> that doesn't seem to be the problem here this morning you could get a front row seat if you were here late and that's about the only seat you can get but <clears throat> that's another message for another time I suppose and, and, and so the, these Greeks are in the back of the crowd, and, and they want to see Jesus. And they, 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 I don't know what their need was, but I do know that they must have had a need to, to get up that early in the morning, make their way out, and fight through a crowd that they wanted to see Jesus. And, and the problem was the crowd was too thick, and it, it just wasn't happening for them. And, and so that, that, that did not deter them. It did not discourage them. The Bible says that they just began to work the crowd, you know, if you will, a little bit. They, they pecked a the guy on a shoulder to this side and they sneaked around him on this side and they were ahead of him. They, they, they dropped something and caught somebody's attention and stepped in front of that person and they, they pushed a few people out of the way and intimidated a few small children and did whatever they had to do but they were moving up in the crowd so much so that, that, that they were moving with the speed and through the crowd that they bumped into a guy and, and they looked up and, and lo and behold they have made it to the front row of the crowd because they have got beyond their Every just bystander and casual observer beyond the saints and they, they have bumped into a disciple, a, a follower of Jesus. They, they bumped into Philip and, 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 and it's interesting to me to note uh, that the Bible says that, that it was Philip of Bethsaida of Galilee. Now, now, Philip, when he was called, the Bible tells us he was from Bethsaida of Galilee. But every other time the Bible references this man, Philip, it simply calls him Philip or Philip, a follower of Jesus, Philip, a disciple. Never again does it reference him as Philip of Bethsaida of Galilee except in this particular text. Now, now the Bible also mentions Andrew in the very next verse, but it doesn't tell us where Andrew's from. But, but it takes a particular time to say, to say Philip of Bethsaida of Galilee. Now, 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 you, you, some of you who know me, I, I just can't take a word there and, and just leave it alone. It, it's there for a reason and a purpose, so we'll dig around and find out why it's there before we're done. But, 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 but these individuals of Greek descent bump into Philip, and, and, and they, they, they were trying to be polite as they could 
would be. They, they didn't want to come across as rude, especially to a disciple. You know, that, that's just not a good thing to do. They, they, they didn't want to come across as impolite, and, 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 but yet they didn't come to see Philip. And so, so they were trying to determine how can we be nice about this thing, but yet at the very same time let the man know that we're not here just to talk to him. And, 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 and so that they, they look at Philip and, and, and probably compliment him on his attire and, and, and nice looking robe and afghan you got going on there, uh, Philip. And, and, but, 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 sir, and notice how polite they're being. The word sir, uh, um, we, we, we love to see you, Philip, but, but sir, uh, we would see Jesus this morning. And, and l- let me just try to pause for just a moment and, and just be as frank with you as I can be. I, I was thankful to come back to Greater Vision. We've got friends here and some familiar faces and I love pastor and all the ministry that's here but but let me just be real honest with you this morning I I didn't come to see you uh, talk to you uh, or just have a good time with you Uh, I've got an ulterior motive this morning Uh, we would uh, see Jesus in this house uh, because it is he uh, that can open blinded eyes Uh, it is he that can unstop deaf ears Uh, it is he uh, that can turn my world uh, around Uh, it's he that can deliver uh, and bless uh, and save Uh, I'm thankful to see you this morning uh, but we would uh, see Jesus uh, in this house We, 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 we went to because of the times this past weekend and, and I don't know if you, any of you ever been there or know what it is it's a, it's a conference where there's a lot of preaching and just, just a really good apostolic conference and, and, and the Holy Ghost had moved through during one of the altar calls and, and I prayed and really got a good touch from God and, and, and somebody that I knew I hadn't seen in a long time made their way to me uh, during the close of altar call and they shook my hand and I greeted them hey good to see you kind of gave them that pat on the back like keep on moving great to see you let's move along now uh, and all of a sudden the preacher got up and another wave of faith swept the building and, and you could just feel the Shekinah glory of God in the house and I was anticipating what was still about to happen I, I could just sense God wasn't done but there was more to come and, and this guy uh, he's like so how you been what's going and I wanted to be so nice to this man I didn't want to be rude but 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 there was another wave of faith coming and I still had a need that I needed met. and I finally looked at him and I said buddy I said it's good to to see you. I'll talk with you in a moment, but I'm going to lift my hands for a moment. Uh, and he kind of moved on and the Holy Ghost swept in. I got news for you. If you're sent by somebody this morning that, that didn't come to see Jesus, you may just have to politely say, sir, ma'am, I'll be happy to go to lunch with you in a moment. Uh, but right now, uh, I need to see Jesus. Uh, I've got a pain uh, in my heart uh, that needs to be mended. Uh, I've got a problem uh, that's too big uh, for me to carry we would see Jesus in this house wow. Wow. So, 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 so they, they, they bump into this Philip dude and they're like, oh, uh, we would see Jesus. Now, 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 it's wonderful to bump into ministry like that. And uh, If you're bumping, rubbing shoulders with ministry, uh, you, you, you're pretty close to Jesus, you would think. Uh, after all, the, he's a follower of Jesus, uh, a disciple of Jesus. Uh, but, but, but as a follower and a disciple of Christ, do you know what his number one responsibility was that day? Not, not, not necessarily he wasn't given it from Jesus, but, but, but he just knew that it was his responsibility. His number one job was to protect Jesus. You watch them do it all over the place. Even in the garden, when they come to take Jesus, Peter pulls out a sword and cuts off Malchus's ear because it was just in them. They were going to protect the one they loved. That was Philip's number one desire and responsibility. I got to keep the crazies away from Jesus. And I got to keep the fanatics away. And, and he's ministering not to one on one individuals right now, but he's ministering to the masses and the multitudes and the crowd. He's teaching and preaching. And so when these Greeks get to Philip, though that's a good sign that they're getting close to Jesus, that does not guarantee them a one on one conversation with Jesus. As a matter of fact, 
more than likely Philip as a disciple is going to say it's good to see you but don't come any closer because he's preaching to the masses right now then that that's what would have taken place except the Bible doesn't say they ran into Philip the disciple it says they ran into Philip of Bethsaida of Galilee now why is that important because as a disciple he would have kept them at arm's length but they tapped into something more than his religious persona they touched something more than his Sunday Christianity they touched a part of Philip that he might have even forgotten about they touched an area of Philip's life that he had covered up and masqueraded with spirituality they touched Philip not as he was in the present but as he used to be I don't know if it was the glimmer in their eye or the hope in their voice or just the look on their face but something about their desperation something about their intent desire to see Jesus tapped into something from Philip's past when he used to live in Bethsaida of Galilee they connected with a Philip that used to be lost that used to be broken that used to be undone they didn't tap into Sunday Philip they tapped into a Philip who knew what it was like to be desperate to see Jesus and because they touched that Philip he said sure let me go talk to him I'll get you an audience with the Lord come to remind somebody such were some of you you've been brought out and bought Oh, thank God for your spirituality. Uh, thank God for your Christianity uh, and your Sunday best. Uh, but don't you forget that saying of Philip. Uh, don't you forget where he brought you from. Uh, don't forget what he did for you. Uh, don't forget what it's like uh, to be desperate uh, to see Jesus. Philip, Philip has this connection now. Now he, he has that connection with these Greeks, and it reminds him of his Bethsaida of Galilee days. He he was a devout studier of the Scripture back then. He knew the law and Moses, and he knew the prophets. But he had something missing in his heart until Jesus came by and said, Philip, follow me. Philip immediately ran to Nathaniel, his friend, and said, come and see him. We have found him that the prophets of old wrote about, that Moses and the law talked about. It was an experience, an awakening, a dawning that this isn't just an average church. This isn't just a social social uh, or a community of friends uh, and family. Uh, but there is something about uh, this Jesus. Uh, he can change uh, our world. Uh, it dawned on Philip. Uh, we have found uh, the very thing uh, that we have been looking for. Uh, can I preach to a visitor, uh, a first time guest, uh, or maybe an individual uh, who hasn't quite given everything to Jesus yet, but you've been flirting with the outskirts of the church uh, let me tell you my friend uh, everything uh, you've been looking for uh, everything you've been needing uh, and everything you've been desiring uh, is all wrapped up uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and you have found him uh, in this house uh, this yeah. Philip Philip has this first time experience with God that changes his world. So much so that he gives up his job, his family, his friends. He sells out to follow Jesus. And then he has these Greeks come up in John chapter 12. And he realizes what they're after. And it rekindles, awakes, and stirs up within Philip that first love experience all over again. But that was not the last experience this man Philip had. No, 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 no. John chapter 14 rolls around. And Philip is having one of those down days as a Christian. Uh-oh. Some of you are waiting on the lightning and blasphemy right there. Down day as a Christian? Don't say that, my God, son. One of the biggest mistakes I think the church has ever made 
is we try to convince people trying to get them into the church that you'll never have another bad day or another problem. And when the first storm comes, they, they pack their bags and head out of the church because we told them that everything was going to be perfect from now on. I got news for you. It rains on the just and the unjust. You're going to have problems in here just like you have out there. The only difference is we have Jesus with us in here. Philip was having one of those down days, kind of like John the Baptist, you know, that forerunner who gave his whole life to Jesus. And then on his dying day, he says, are you here or should we look for another? Bo, you lived your whole life preaching this. And on your dying day, he still had questions. Are you really God? Philip was having one of those days. I know I had a revelatory experience back in John chapter 1. And I know the Greeks kind of stir all that up and reaffirmed it all in John chapter 12. But we're in John 14 now. And I've got to be honest with you, Jesus. I'm having one of those moments of uncertainty. And he looked at Jesus and said, look, I know you're a great teacher and a great man. But but are you really he? Or, or should we look for another? He basically said it by saying, Lord, show us the Father. And it would suffice us. Lord. Is there something more uh, that, that you've got to offer than just you? Uh, is there something else uh, that I should be looking for? Lord, I'm thankful to be walking with you and talking with you. Uh, but I'm having one of those days where it doesn't seem like you're enough uh, to get me through. Lord, uh, are, are, are you it? Uh, or, or can you show me the Father? Uh, and it would suffice us in Jesus uh, reared back with a holy uh, boldness and a righteous indignation. Uh, and he looked at Philip uh, and said, Bo, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. He is in me, and I am in he. Let me just tell somebody, a Philip in this house, you don't need to look for another religion, another theology, another program or another manifestation on your good days he is God and on your bad days he is God you don't need to look for another he is the one he is the only there is nobody else beside him hero Israel the Lord our God is one Lord there is one Lord and one faith and one baptism one God who is father of all who is above all through all and in you all he is Alpha and Omega the beginning and the ending the first and the last the rose of Sharon the lily of the valley the bride and the morning star he is the shepherd of the sheep the door to the sheepfold and the lamb slain from the foundation of the world he will be your healer and he will be your deliverer he'll be your all in all he is the father and he is the son and he is the Holy Ghost all uh, at the very same time. <laughs> Philip blows him away. My God, my Lord and my God, you, you, you're the one. I don't need nothing else. I'm good to die right now and go to heaven. I've got revelations, what Philip felt like. He's had his John 1 experience, he's had his John 12 experience, and he's had his John 14 experience. And then Acts rolls around. Jesus has ascended into the heavens, the Holy Ghost has came, and Philip goes from a follower and a disciple to a sent one and an apostle. And Philip gets sent to Samaria to hold his first revival. Hey, first opportunity. To take the mic and to say something behind the pulpit. I remember, I remember being 12 years old and getting that opportunity for the very first time in church to preach. And I studied for about a month for it and uh, just about every day for about eight hours a day, I think. And fasted a couple of days and prayed all I could pray. And 
I just knew that that night in that little home missions church of 15, that when I took the mic, all kinds of glory and fire was going to fall and revelation and the whole city was going to be saved and I'd be preaching general conference the next week. I just knew it was going to happen. I had it all figured out. And I took the pulpit and seven minutes and 15 seconds later, it was over and the glory cow had already lifted and I wasn't sure what had happened to it. Here is Philip, first revival, whole city of Samaria. What you going to preach, Philip? Uh, my first message, I did my best to go from Genesis to Revelation to make sure they knew that I knew the whole Bible, and I did it all in seven minutes and 15 seconds. Pretty impressive. <laughs> my wife tells me now I get hung up on one verse and preach for an hour on it. She says, move along. <laughs> And so Philip has his opportunity to preach this great theological masterpiece that, that will cause everybody to ooh and ah over this new revelation that he's got a hold of. He can preach anything and everything he wants to preach to make angels draw near and devils run far. He, he can do it all. He, he's got the mic and a whole city to listen to him. And, and, and he tries to figure out what he's going to preach. I don't know how long he studied. He was probably thinking about his message while Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost because he knew he had a revival coming up. And so he, all these thoughts are flooding through his mind. And he, he gets that opportunity to preach, but... To our amazement at least, he doesn't preach his general conference greatest camp meeting revival message. He, he doesn't preach no deep theology that, that, that we've never heard of before. Do you know what the Bible says that Philip preached to Samaria? It was very simple. He preached to him one word. The Bible says that Philip got up and he preached Christ unto them. Philip got up behind that pulpit and he must have said something like this. I've tried to study and find some deep theological thing that will blow your mind but then I got to thinking about my first experience in John 1 and I thought about my experience with the Greeks in John 12 and I thought about my second experience in John 14 and after thinking about all of those experiences there's only one thing that's really important I'll just preach to you Christ and him crucified and the Bible said the Bible says great joy fell on the city and there were signs and wonders and miracles and before it was all said and done they were baptized in Jesus name and filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost it doesn't take no deep theology all you need is Jesus 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 will do it every time I've come to preach to the broken hearted Jesus I've come to preach to the sick in body Jesus I've come to preach to the bound and tormented his name is Jesus uh, preaches Jesus that's it Bible breaks out and before they can call him up to the platform so they can say what a great message you preached this morning brother Philip God picks that jewel up and takes him into the middle of the wilderness and sets him down in front of an oncoming chariot and Philip goes say, what? Come on, Lord. I just preached. I wanted to stick around for the results. And you bring me to the middle of nowhere right in front of an oncoming chariot. What is up with that? And God said, Philip, there's a man in that chariot, an Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading scripture, and he doesn't understand it. Go help the man out. And Philip went, hopped up in that chariot. The man was reading out of the book of Isaiah. He was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. A sheep before shears was done. Um, all of those great things and, and an Ethiopian eunuch looked at Philip and Philip looked back at him and said do you understand what you read and the Ethiopian eunuch said I don't have a clue is this man talking about himself or is he talking about another or what's going on and Philip looks around and with a smile on his face he, he could have taken him from deep theology somewhere deep in the roots of Isaiah but it wasn't necessary Philip knew what everybody wanted to hear anyway 
way. And the Bible says he began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And before it was all said and done, that man was baptized and filled with the power of God all because of Jesus. If you've got a crowd, talk about Jesus. If you've got an audience of one, talk about Jesus. If you're preaching to yourself at home, talk about Jesus. Because all roads lead to Jesus. That wasn't good enough for you, so, so let, let's try it this way. You're saying, of course he preached to him Jesus. It was a prophecy about Jesus out of Isaiah. Let, 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 let's just say, for example, that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading about the garden experience in the book of Genesis. I would tell you this morning, Philip would have preached unto him Jesus. He would have said there was a serpent there who bruised his heel, but in the end, he bruised his head. It's all about Jesus. If he had been reading about Jacob resting his head on a rock uh, or rock coming from water in the wilderness uh, he would have preached unto him Jesus uh, and he would have talked about a stone uh, that the builders rejected uh, the rock of ages uh, if he had been reading about manna fallen from heaven uh, he would have preached unto him Jesus uh, he would have said he is the bread uh, of life uh, and man shall not live by bread alone uh, but by every word uh, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God uh, if he had been reading about the butler and the baker uh, in the story of Joseph he would have preached unto him Jesus because while the baker in three days was taken out and hung on a tree the butler was simultaneously exalted into a kingly palace it was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ if he would have been reading about Melchizedek he would have preached unto him Jesus if he had been reading about the fourth man in the fire he would have preached unto him Jesus if he had been reading anywhere in the Old Testament or anywhere at all in history he would have preached unto him Jesus because from Genesis to Malachi and Matthew, Mark, Luke and John they all point they all point they all point to Jesus from Acts to Revelation they all point back to Jesus because all roads I said all roads lead to Jesus If it was Philip a man of Bethsaida of Galilee, or if it was some Greeks looking for Jesus, or if it was an Ethiopian eunuch, or if you're in Africa, or if you're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or if you're at Greater Vision in Perigo, Arkansas, Jesus works the same on everybody. Ethiopians and Greeks and Arkansas people and Philadelphia people and Jesus works the same on absolutely everybody. You want some deep theology this morning? Here's as deep as I go. Jesus is the answer to all of your problems. I've read that book from cover to cover. I read it from Genesis to Revelation, and I only can truly see one story that the Bible is trying to tell us. Everything you need is found in Jesus. That's what the Bible says in a nutshell. If you've been saved and living this for years, months, days, weeks, whatever, you're saved, you feel like this morning. The answer to all your problems is still in Jesus. If you've never given your heart to God, and you're living here this morning knowing that if the trumpet sounds, you're in trouble. The answer to all your problems is Jesus. If you've lived it before, but you're backslidden right now, and you know your heart's not right, the answer to all your problems is Jesus. If you're half in and half out and you're kind of lukewarm right now, the answer to all your problems is Jesus. If you're male or you're female, if you are young or you are old, if you are Jewish or Greek or anything else in between, the answer to all your problems is Jesus. Somebody wrote and said, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Somebody else said, Jesus Jesus, there's just something about that name. Somebody else said, we've got the power in the name of Jesus. Here's what I want to know this morning. Can, can, can we just pull off the masquerade of religion just for 30 seconds? Can we do that? Just pretend we're all human here. 
If you've got a problem that's too complicated for you to solve this morning, throw your hand right now in the air. Keep your hand lifted high, unashamedly. You've got a burden that's too heavy to bear that you need a miracle for. Throw your hand in the air and join them right now. You need healing in your body. Throw your hand in the air. Financial problem. Throw your hand in the air. Unashamedly. Come on. Lost loved ones you need saved. Throw your hand in the air. Your heart's not right this morning. Throw your hand in the air. You need to pray back through. If you lifted your hand on any or all of those, stand to your feet right now. I will not hype you up during this altar call this morning. I will not invite everybody to the altar this morning. I won't do that. But what I want to know if there is somebody who would like to leave here different than what you came. There's somebody under the sound of my voice who needs a touch and you need to leave here different. Whether it's healing, deliverance, blessing, or salvation, you're here and you need a touch. I want you to step out right now and come. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't see who's coming, who's not. Just come right now this morning. We will not embarrass you. I will not call you out. We'll not make fun of you. But if you want a touch from Jesus, just join us. And God will come. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. You have not because you ask not. Make your way. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. We'll give it just a moment this morning. There are others who want to come and need to come and join us this morning, if you will. Not to put you on the spot or embarrass you. You're just, you're just kind of tired of living like you've been living. You need a change. You're just kind of tired of carrying the same problem you've been carrying. You're ready to lay it down. Just come. Because Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Let's just get past that whole facade that you come to the altar when you first need to be saved and you can't come for anything else or we all might think you're back. So let's get past all that this morning. I'm a dying man preaching to dying people this morning. We have problems that are too big to solve. We need Jesus. Now I wonder if I can find a couple of people who are full of faith, who've had an experience with Jesus, who would come stand behind one of these. Would you do it right now? Can I find an elder? Can I find a minister? Can I find a sister or a brother, somebody who would join me for a moment? Come and find somebody to stand with, somebody to pray with. Link up with somebody this morning in prayer. and Somebody needs you to be Philip to them. They need you to talk about Jesus. They need you to pray Jesus over their situation right now. Come on, lift your voice right now, saints of God. All across the building now, would you join me from right to left and front to back? Would you lift your hands? Close your eyes and lift your voice. We've got some people here who don't want to leave the same way that they came. They need Jesus. Come on, lift your voice. I'm thankful to see each and every one of you, but we would see Jesus. Come on, can you lift your voice for just another moment this morning? Come on, in closing, somebody lift your voice as they get ready and sing right now. Come on, somebody lift your voice. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end. It'll always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus be the center of my life, come on, Jesus that's it, be the center of my life, come on, that's it, lift your voice,
Come on, that's it, saints of God. Jesus Come on, that's it, friend. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Nothing 